Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're going to discuss the new talks on e-commerce which are going to be announced in Davos. Though that should not have been the platform for these talks anyway because as we know, currently the global trading architecture is the World Trading Organization or, the organization or WTO. But I mean, there, what explains the sudden shift to Davos of this so-called e-commerce talks? We'll have to go to the background of what is happening. It was in 2017 when WTO had its ministerial in Buenos Aires. The ministerial of a WTO is their main uh, plenary body which sets the agenda of WTO for the next two years. And at that time, a lot of US and its allies wanted WTO to start taking up e-commerce issues. Even though or, the development agenda the Doha round, things are still under abeyance. Exactly. And and on one side, the traditional stand of developing countries has been that till development agenda issues are sorted out, no new issues, which have been called like Singapore issues, for instance, would be taken up, including investment issues and such. But this definitely was a new issue. So that was one part that no new issues should be taken up. And in any case, India, African countries said that this area is too new. Uh, things are not very clear to and therefore starting to make global rules about it, it's premature. And they did not allow this to happen. And they stood firm and the WTO ministerial did not take a decision on starting negotiations at the WTO in that meeting. Now, what happened after that was, and during that meeting itself, some countries, uh, mostly Japan, um, Singapore, from developing country side, if you can call Singapore a developing country, uh, it's a member if of G77. If you can call it a country anyway, in, in small case, little towns. In, but a member of G77. Which should have been either a Malaysia or Indonesia. Yes. So that's what it really so, is. Yes, exactly. So in, in Asia, Singapore is one big uh, watery. Japan, Australia, US, uh, they got together and also pulled on their side some developing countries. And I'll come to why those developing countries you know, get onto this bandwagon. But some of these countries got together and made a plurilateral declaration at the WTO meeting, which was called as the Joint Statement on E-Commerce Initiative, in which they said that they will start exploring the possibilities of negotiations on new e-commerce rules. And after they made that declaration, and after Buenos Aires ended, they started holding meetings inside the WTO, uh, exploring this agenda, which whose legality has been questioned because even a plurilateral inside WTO is allowed only if all the members with consensus allow that to happen. And in this case, the consensus was that new talks on e-commerce should not start. And that was going on over the last one year, over all of 2018. And now these countries say that the situation is mature enough to start negotiations. And of all places, it chose the World Economic Forum, Davos. Shall we say the Forum of the Rich. Yes. I That's mean, what which it is really quite paradoxical, is. but yeah. yeah. So it, I think the interests of the rich are very clear that if that's the forum they choose to announce these negotiations, plurilateral negotiations, it's really the Forum of the Rich asking that this be done to help them further. Leaving that out But one the, point, the paradoxical part of it is that if you ever talk to them, what are these talks about? They always say that it's about medium and small enterprises of developing countries. They're trying to help the developing You know, countries. whenever the rich want to talk about anything, it's always for the poor. Yeah. You know, everything they want, even tax concessions, have been always for the poor, and we know that. Leaving that out for the time being, what is e-commerce? And what is at the core of this so-called e-commerce discussions? Well, first of all, it is not e-commerce. And we know e-commerce, when we think e-commerce, we talk about getting some things on e-commerce platforms. We order something, something gets delivered to us, and it looks so convenient, and people tend to say that e-commerce is a good thing. Why? I have to walk to a shop, and the shopkeeper can deliver a thing to my house. And that's what normally e-commerce is made to look like. But this is much more than e-commerce. First of all, what is happening in a shopkeeper delivering it to your house is not just the delivery, but behind it is data and platforms. But not only that, here when we talk about what is called e-commerce, is Uber, uh, is Airbnb, uh, all kind of digital corporations, including Google's and uh, Facebook's, by the way. So first of all, we should be calling it digital trade and not e-commerce to 
to say the least. And at the heart of the discussions is that developed countries want that the data flows between the countries should not be stopped. Right so now, the argument regarding data localization, that is at the heart of the so-called e-commerce discussions? Absolutely, it's the crux. Because if you really think about it, we have been using Facebook and Google for years. We've been using Microsoft, everybody's been doing business, even Amazons of this world have been doing business. And nobody has figured out what is it that is happening which should not happen or what is not happening should be uh, facilitated by new rules. So the rules really are not there to facilitate something, but they really are afraid that as developing countries learn that data is a valuable resource, they are going to talk about controlling its flows, maximizing economic value for themselves. And before they understand that, they want countries to sign on a global agreement that data can flow freely across the globe. So at the heart of these discussions is indeed uh, data flows. So this is what I think the Justed Coalition, <coughs> to which you and I both belong, termed it as a data colonialism, that one of the early, ex you know, uh, uh, what we'll say the colonial empire's basic advantage was they control the seas. And if in this world you control the data, then you control the economies. Is, would that be a way of looking at it? More or less. Uh, I mean, probably the seas can be compared to the networks as the, as the channels on, through which data flows. And if you control the channels of data flow, uh, then that's equivalent to controlling the seas. And that's equivalent to the old kind of colonization. But data itself, perhaps, is more comparable to raw material, whereby uh, developed countries colonized developing countries, took raw material from these countries. From that raw material, manufacturing goods were manufactured in developed countries and they were sold back to the markets in developing countries. Now data is taken and, and manufacturing and manufactured goods in the form of digital services are manufactured in uh, developed countries and then they're sold back uh, to developing countries and this is a new cycle. Well, you know, I think the other aspect of it, as you have touched upon in some of your articles, is also the growth of the platforms. And the platforms encompass the informal sector that, they, that exists, and uh, local mom and pop stores, which still exist in very large numbers in India, for instance, can be enclosed by a Flipkart or an Amazon. And therefore, this platform economy is, in fact, which rely on data, of course. The platform economies, in fact, are also doing enclosures of the informal sector, and the net result will be really huge loss of employment in the informal sector as they take it over. Absolutely. Employment loss and autonomy, economic autonomy of these small informal uh, actors is lost. An example of Uber drivers is very much in front of So uh, you talk us. about Uber being actually as, as if they're independent entrepreneurs, but they really are essentially workers who invest in it themselves by buying cars, paying the installments and so on. So they are not entrepreneurs, they're really Absolutely. glorified Absolutely. workers. Absolutely, a new kind of labor which actually buys the capital itself, capital, uh, but, goods, itself. Uh, capital goods itself, uh, but then act as labor. So you take the, put the risk also on the labor, apart from the other negative things that labor uh, suffers in an economic relationship. And that uh, exactly is the situation. And going to what you were describing as a platform which encloses the informal uh, sectors, whether they are small traders or they are taxi owners or they are people who may have some accommodation or it could be a barber or a, or a domestic help or a plumber, Any all, service. These, all these people, service. all service can be organized by a platform. Now, I want to also put it in another way. There's a good side of the digital. Of course, there's a huge amount of efficiency that there would be plumbers in one part of the city and you want a plumber who maybe is just crossing close to your house and you don't know that person is close to your house and there's a great inefficiency in calling a shopkeeper and the shopkeeper saying somebody will come tomorrow and all that. And that, you know, it happens in taxis, also happens in retail. And digital efficiencies can organize all this in a manner in which huge amount of efficiencies and positive value is released for the society. In that sense, it's a bit like industrialization. When mechanization comes, 
Its efficiencies are such that it has a historic force which is very difficult to resist. And the digital also has that kind of a force because it releases a huge amount of efficiencies. So in a way, that is good. But the point is that extra value which is released, who gets that extra value? Does the consumer and the service provider distribute those, that value between themselves and perhaps a third party player who facilitates gets a small part of the fees or somebody comes and takes most of its value and the consumer and the service provider are squeezed to the minimum possible uh, you know, value situation. So bulk of the enclosure is a, the consequence of this enclosure is bulk of the what you say the increased value, the efficiency increase really leads to value accretion to the platform. Absolutely. That's absolutely. what you absolutely. really That's say. the problem. So digital is not the problem. The manner in which the digital value is monopolized and a very big part of it is taken by one actor. And earlier times, there used to be national regulation to look around these kind of situations to control yeah. market power. There are none today. And the second problem is most of this takes place at not a national scale, but at a global scale, which makes regulation even more difficult. And the second part of the e-commerce negotiations which are going on apart from the data part is to foreclose developing countries ever being able to make effective regulation to stop that monopolization and centralization of value capture by saying, for example, that you can't say that a digital company should have a local presence. And if you don't have a local presence, you can, of course, not regulate it. Uh, you can't uh, look up uh, its uh, source code uh, for regulating because you need to look up the source code to see what kind of uh, decisions a certain algorithm is taking. So apart from data flows, all other provisions relate to, uh, to preempting countries having national regulation and therefore this inequality of data capture is a major so issue. To put it, put it, to paraphrase this, what it means is if you don't control the data flows, you cannot control those companies. If you can't control those companies, neither can you regulate them, you probably cannot even tax them because you will not know how much they're really generating out of your country. All of these are the consequences of what absolutely, will happen. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. as we can see, uh, the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world, neither accept, for instance, Indian law when it comes to their Indian operations, nor do they accept very easy taxation policies because the bulk of the wealth they keep in tax havens claiming this is really the royalty we have to pay the headquarters, which is somehow in Cayman Islands or in some such uh, tax haven so that not, you can't even, even tax it. So it's really Absolutely. not Absolutely. only the question of control of, or for regulatory purposes, even for taxation purposes. Yes, uh, as you were saying, one of the problems in digital value chains is that it's very difficult to ascribe where exactly the value capture took place. And therefore, they can always conveniently say it took place in a place where the tax is minimum. Zero, uh, zero by the way, it most likely, because I, I'll give you an example. One of the top credit card companies in India uh, were moving uh, their data to their headquarters in New Zealand and showing the maximum value capture in New Zealand. Uh, and they will declare that uh, though we take, uh, uh, take data from people transactions here, the value is created in the analysis uh, which takes place, which takes place uh, in the headquarters and therefore the maximum value is created in New Zealand and therefore it should be taxed there. And later on, the income tax guys found out that they actually sent the data back to uh, BPO units in Pune. And that's where the transactions of uh, value capture really took place. And they asked them to pay tax because neither are they collecting data in New Zealand nor they analyzing data in New Zealand. It just makes a wrong uh, round trip uh, to escape uh, taxes. And just one example, Uber does it all the time. Uh, they show that the value is created uh, outside in Ireland. All these companies try to show that the value is created in a place where they have nearly zero taxes. So effectively, the argument is if we allow this, shall we say, data flows not to be impeded at all by national boundaries, what we're really talking about is extraterritorial control of your economy by certain global players. And those global players, of course, are backed by the big countries, in this case, the United States and a few other Western countries. Yes. Uh, when you say uh, US and some other developing countries, I think we just- Developed countries. Developed countries, sorry. We just say it out of habit, though actually EU does not own any digital uh, business platform. or digital platforms of any worth. 
uh, as the head of Naspers, which is African largest African company and owns the biggest uh, portion of Tencent, uh, said recently when he was in India that uh, EU is a digital colony of the US. Uh, so well, that 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 was a point uh, on the on the side. And yes, uh, so they get controlled from outside, and what. And, and another angle to data flows is that data in our understanding, and I'm also doing some paper on that, is a collective economic resource. First of all, it is an economic resource. West would like to make you believe that it is just an issue of privacy, which it is, of course, uh, but it is also an economic resource. They won't allow you to be understood as an economic resource. Second, even if you understand it as an economic resource, they will try to make it look like it's an individual's economic resource. And they're all kind of these new schemes where individuals try to monetize uh, data. It's not worked, it's a flop, it's a dud idea. Individuals' transaction costs in trying to do all those things and expertise needed is just too high to show a promising balance. And nobody does that. It has failed everywhere. So the only way people can leverage it as a resource is as a collective resource. Whether as a community, you are part of the town, it owns the consumer behavior of that kind of people. Or, or, or a kind of uh, a group, uh, a tribal group has always been, you know, they have had indigenous uh, ownership of intellectual property as well. But here, all groups are implicated. Or as a national community, they own the consumer behavior, they own how, how uh, cars tra commute on the roads of Delhi, for instance. All this collective data is supposed to be a collective resource. And only if we can control the data flows can we start leveraging this collective resource, for example, to promote our own industry. So uh, our draft e-commerce policy of India, which is now being held back because of a lot of pressures, actually says that this kind of data would be reserved for small businesses in India, uh, which allows you to promote your infant digital industry, which is what we did for industrialization as well. We protected our infant industry. So these kind of things would not be possible if you can't control your data flows. Thank you very much, Parminder, for being with us explaining what's really an esoteric topic for most of us. But increasingly, we all are, as you said, participants in the digital economy. So we have vital stake in it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prabir. This is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click.